So thank you everyone for joining. Um, I can't do the quick math in my head, but <laughs> I can assure you that there are at least uh, 30, maybe 35 of you tonight. So welcome to you all. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing that now so you can see my entry slide. Okay, here we go. So again, welcome everyone to the Lucky Mute Watershed Council's first SIPs and Science uh, event of the fall. Uh, we we normally, I mean, well, I can't say normal anymore, but before COVID, we had these at our local pubs and, and uh, restaurants and coffee shops, and that, that was such an uh, amazing experience to be able to see you all and to interact um, in person. But since COVID, of course, we've switched to a virtual format for the time being. And I will say that one benefit of this is that we can reach a lot more of you, a lot, a lot more folks are able to join us from different areas, maybe some further away from our uh, local uh, pubs and restaurants. But, you know, it, it's, it's always a good time. Um, I've learned to love the virtual uh, experience as well. So again, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Suzanne Teller. I'm the Lucky Mute Watershed Council Outreach Coordinator. And also with us tonight is Kendra Callahan. She's our uh, Lucky Mute Watershed Council Outreach Assistant. Uh, and we have, of course, our speaker for the evening, Jennifer Beef, and she's the for a Forester and Outreach Manager for Starker Forests. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll have a more detailed introduction in a minute, but first I want to go over some uh, housekeeping. Um, this presentation is being recorded so that you'll be able to view it at a later date if you wish, or you can also, you will also be able to share it with uh, with anyone, you know, that you, you wish to share this with, or if you know of somebody who wanted to be here that couldn't be here, um, I will be sure to send out an email to everyone who participates tonight about when that recording is available. It will be available on our website and on YouTube as well. Uh, your video and microphone will be turned off for the entire presentation. However, um, we do, this is an interactive uh, presentation, so you will be able to ask questions. Please type in all of your questions using the Q&A feature. If you kind of hover on the bottom or, or the top, depends on what format you're using, you'll see a Q&A feature. And uh, though we're gonna wait to answer, uh, Jennifer requests that we wait till the end of her presentation to ask all questions, please feel free to fill them in as you think of them so you don't forget anything. And uh, we'll be sure to get to them. Uh, Kendra will be helping streamline this process at the end by, uh, by verbally, by asking the questions to Jennifer, going through them, uh, making sure that similar questions are together and making sure that if a question has already been answered, we don't ask twice. So uh, she'll be managing that process. We expect that everybody's question will be able to be answered um, during the course of this talk. But if for any reason we don't get to it, out of, run out of time, um, we will make sure that you have a way to ask those questions, um, you know, provide contact information. So don't worry about that. There is a chat feature available, but please just use this uh, for communicating with us if you have a technical issue or uh, or something like that. Uh, the Q&A feature is where you would be use what you would be using to ask questions about the presentation itself. So um, next, I'd like to take a moment to well, advance my slide. Let's see. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to thank our friends of the LWC and our business circle members for helping to provide the funding for this event. We are really grateful for, for their support, for your support, those of you that have joined us tonight, and for the support of all of our donors and volunteers who help make our Love Your Watershed program possible. So thank you so much. As a watershed council, we work with uh, we work with many different community partners, organizations, schools, agencies, landowners of all types to protect, restore, and enhance the uh, rivers, the lands, and the lands of the Lucky Mute and the Ash Creek watershed. Uh, Starker Forest is one of these valued partners, and uh, we've uh, worked with Starker in several of our restoration efforts in the Lucky Mute, along the Lucky Mute River, and in several of the tributaries. So, uh, thank you once again. For, for your partnerships, um, Jennifer. In addition to our on the ground restoration and monitoring programs, the LWC is working to build stronger connections between people and place. 
Our Love Your Watershed program provides opportunities to learn more about the local rivers, uh, landscapes, plants, animals, and the human communities, uh, um, as well as how to take action to protect and restore their health. For 2021 and 2022, our theme for the Love Your Watershed program is uh, exploring the history of our watershed. But we're not just focused on the short history of our watershed council. And, um, and by the way, we are celebrating our 20th uh, anniversary this year. Um, we are also taking time to recognize and honor the much longer history of the watershed and those who were here first, the Kalapuya. The Kalapuya orig originally occupied over a million acres in the Willamette and Umpqua Valleys. Composed of about 19 tribes and bands, the Kalapuya have lived here for over 14,000 years, enduring enormous upheaval and change during the past 200 years, most notably being forcibly removed from their homelands uh, in, the, in the 1855. The primary bands of Kalapuya that that occupy, that, um, that are in our service area are the Lucky Mute, the Yamhill, and the Chapinifa. Today, descendants of these bands and all the Kalapuya are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. They continue to endure and contribute enormously to their own communities and across the land we refer to as the Lucky Mute and the Ash Creek watersheds. I encourage you to dig deeper and learn more about the tribes that exist in the places that you live and work. And I've provided two resources on this slide that can help you do that. I'm also going to put these in the chat box so you can save them for later. And I'll do that in a minute here. Okay, here we go. So it is now time to move into the main event and bring you our speaker for the evening, Jennifer B. Jennifer will be talking to you about Starker's history and how Starker Forests incorporates ecological knowledge, science, and research into their forest management practices historically and today. So Jennifer, I will let you share your screen. Thank you so much for being with us. Hey, thanks, Suzanne. Oh, it did it again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there. How does that look? Oh, perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for having me. My name is Jennifer Beeth. I'm a forester at Starker Forest and also outreach manager. Uh, I'm a dirt forester at heart. Um, I have a forest engineering degree from Oregon State and have been working at Starker Forest for uh, over 23 years. Um, I was out in a in the field today in a stream with uh, salmon spawning today, so that um, put me in a really good mood. So happy to be here and uh, give you this presentation tonight about Starker Forest, a little bit about who we are and how we operate. Uh, our uh, tagline is that we're growing forests, not just trees. Uh, these are pictures of the Starker family. Uh, throughout the years, there's we're a fifth generation family owned forest landowner. Um, here in uh, Corvallis is where our headquarters are, but we uh, own uh, about uh, 90,000 acres um, in Benton County, Polk County, uh, Lynn County, uh, Lincoln County, and a little bit in Lane County as well. So we began in 1936 when TJ Sterker began to purchase second growth forest land parcels uh, here in Benton County. Uh, Sterker Forest was officially formed in 1971 with partners TJ, his son, Bruce, Bruce's wife, Betty, and their sons, Bart and Bond. Uh, as I mentioned, we're a fifth generation business today. So there's, I think, 11 uh, young youngsters that are in the fifth generation and we manage over 90,000 acres of forest land. So we're managed by the Starker family, a board of directors and a staff of dedicated foresters and professionals. Uh, we're committed to sustainability and good stewardship of our forest lands. We've established sustainability framework to enhance the long-term economic, environmental and community sustainability of our business practices. 
This picture on the top here is not of our um, employees. It's a, actually a picture of a tour, but I thought it was a really great picture to show uh, one of the things that we get involved with and it's it's tours. So we've been involved with, with tours with watershed councils and um, other organizations around uh, the region. Um, we send our logs to over 30 uh, manufacturing facilities here in Oregon. Uh, and Oregon has over 61,000 forest sector workers. Uh, we, there's three different uh, forms of forest certification in the United States. Um, there's FSC, uh, Forest Stewardship Council, and SFI, um, uh, which I'm drawing a blank on the, what it stands for right now. Um, and then there's the American Tree Farm System uh, certification. And what the certifications do is validate and recognize that we're committed to doing the best for the land and that we meet the standards of um, sustainability for the American Tree Farm System. SFI, Sustainable Forestry Initiative. I knew it would come to me. Um, while the end product of what we, how we operate is to produce logs to turn into wood products, uh, it always starts with us with reforestation. And um, that goes back uh, to when we started in the 1930s when TJ Starker acquired his forest lands and uh, much of the land was available because it had already been harvested and people viewed it as having no value anymore. Um, but he knew as a forester that he could plant trees and the timber value would return someday. So today we uh, plant a, about a half a million trees per year. Our seedlings are grown in nurseries in Oregon and British Columbia. We have a fall planting season and a winter planting season. We uh, intensively uh, prepare the site for, uh, for planting and that helps mitigate fire risk. Um, and the one great thing about having young forests on our ownership is that they're really good for pollinators and also deer and elk if anybody's um, a hunter. They usually go to the young forest. Uh, in terms of timber harvest, uh, our, our harvest is about a thousand to twelve hundred acres per year. We thin the forest when they're age uh, 20 to 30, uh, maybe even up to 35 for improved stand growth. Uh, and we have a final harvest age between 50 and 80 years, so it's generally older than the industry average. Um, our company contributes about a hundred family wage jobs to our local community. So we employ uh, 20 people here directly out of our office, but if you added up, uh, added all of our contractors and um, other businesses that we work with, we can get up to about a hundred, hundred family wage jobs. And we always strive to be great neighbors by communicating and, and engaging directly with, with our neighbors. Um, in terms of outreach, uh, it's an it's before there's a, everybody's talking in, in COVID speak now. It's like before COVID and during COVID. I'm looking forward to saying after uh, you know after COVID, but um, historically we've connected with thousands of um, members of the public every year, predominantly youth through different community events. Um, we have a youth tree planting day. We offer elementary school field trips. Uh, at our um, interpretive trail near Blodgett. We offer public tours and then participate in community events. So the Lucky Meat Watershed Council had a recreation fair in the past and we didn't ever participate in person, but we provided a little signage that um, Suzanne was great enough to uh, put on a table just showing that we offer free permits for recreation on our lands. And all you have to do is give our office a call and. We used to ask that for people to come into our office and COVID has changed that. So now we just do it over the phone with a DocuSign. Recreation is a, is a big part of, um, it's a lot bigger than it used to be for us. Uh, historically, hunting was the main recreation permit that we issued. Uh, but in recent years, uh, we've seen a rise in, um, particularly mountain biking has become a lot more popular but also hiking, running, trail running, uh, horseback riding, photography, and, and dog walking. Um, and since this is SIPS and Science, I wanted to mention that we do own some forest lands that are really close to the ocean. And what that means for tree growing is that the species of trees that grows is spruce. 
And there's a couple local breweries who make beer with the spruce tips. And so this, uh, this is the bottom picture with the people in it um, is uh, some folks from Block 15 Brewery. Uh, and they came out in the spring. And you could, we were so close to the ocean, you can hear it. And they pick the, the tips off the spruce trees and uh, they picked hundreds of pounds. So if you can see on the picture on the right, there's a bucket. And I think I picked for like two hours and it was like not even half the bucket. I, it was it was very sad. And, um, but these other pickers were picking really fast and they ended up with, um, I think like 150 pounds of these spruce tips and they would uh, freeze them and then save them for some of the beers that they were brewing um, in the summer. And then I, I think that they might have one. Uh, they said ho a holiday time, so I don't know the name of it. But, uh, Dirt Road Brewing in Philomath also um, harvested some spruce tips and put it in their beer. Uh, water quality and wildlife habitat is really important to us. We work with a certified wildlife biologist to develop and implement our wildlife plan. Um, the Department of Environmental Quality has reported that the best water quality in the state does come from forest lands, including actively managed forest lands. Uh, all fish streams have timbered buffers to maintain high water quality, um, and we improve uh, fish habitat by providing fish passage and stream complexity. Uh, the Sarker family generously supports community organizations that invest in art, uh, culture, youth, basic needs, science, education, and the environment. These photos are at uh, the Bruce Starker Arts Park in Corvallis um, and the adjacent Old Mill Center, which the Starker family has been uh, supporting uh, in, for many, many years. So the pond there on the left, that was just renovated. It was kind of turned into like a mucky duck pond and they added those aeration uh, fountains and they're now I think it's it's actually suitable habitat for wildlife. So moving into a little bit about the history of forestry and forest management in the United States, um, everything we do in forestry is based in science. Uh, in 1898, professional forestry schools in the United States were established at Cornell University in New York and at Biltmore in North Carolina. You may have heard of the Biltmore Estate, or if you've been there, you might have um, been able to get a tour. Um, followed by Yale Forest School in uh, 1900. So the Cradle of Forestry near, near Biltmore is um, in Asheville, North Carolina, was created by Congress in 1968 to preserve, develop, and make available to this and future generations the birthplace of forestry and forest education in America. So the pictures here show on the top the dedication of PV, PV Arboretum in 1926. Uh, and then the bottom picture is the Cradle of Forestry in uh, North Carolina. So the first forestry class um, at Oregon Agricultural College, which we know now is OSU, was in 1896, followed by a four-year degree program established in 1906. So T.J. Starker enrolled in OAC in 1908 and was among the first four graduates of the School of Forestry in 1910. So he had had some previous uh, schooling that um, allowed him to only do this uh, time at OAC for two years. Um, and his senior thesis at the time was examining the costs associated with a logging operation. So he pursued further studies at the University of Michigan and he worked for the US Forest Service in Oregon. He returned to Corvallis in 1922 to assume a post as professor, professor in the School of Forestry. He taught coursework in civiculture, wood identification, timber technology, and park forestry. I'm actually curious what park forestry means in um, the 1920s, and I don't know. <laughs> um, Along with George PV, TJ played a major role in coordinating the acquisition of lands that became the McDonald Dunn Research Forest. Uh, TJ managed the post farm that is shown here in the top picture. It started in 1928. Uh, the purpose was to determine the longevity of the wood in the natural state and with various treatments. Some of the treatments included osmosis salts, charred wood, just like uh, burned wood, uh, which didn't turn out to be um, very, um, have a, good longevity. 
uh, creosoted pressure treated wood and uh, kemenite, which is kind of like the, um, is it the uh, ammonium, copper, arsenic, and I'm missing one of the ingredients there, but um, anyway. Uh, I, I was reading this TJ Starker oral history interviews, which can be found online, and came up with a couple of really good quotes that I wanted to share. Uh, he said, uh, as I say, the only people teaching forestry in the state were at OAC. The pers professor then was E.R. Lake, who was a botanist, and he was the head of the department. He saw the handwriting on the wall that foresters were going to be one of the future occupations. So he thought he ought to leave and get a real forester at the head. And that's when they hired Peavy in 1910. Lake went back to Washington, D.C. as a nut specialist. And uh, the second quote I, I took was when uh, he was interested in um, uh, volunteering for World War I. And they, I don't know who they were, but he said, they said, no, you have to stay here because we need you. My job was to go around all the spruce country. So this would specifically be like within five miles of the coast uh, and get the mills to cut up and ship spruce airplane stock. We had a cut up plant in Vancouver, Washington, and all they wanted was nice, straight, fine grain material to put into air, airplane stock. So in forestry in the United States, we have a professional forestry society. It's the Society of American Foresters. Uh, Gifford Pinchot believed that high standards were essential to bringing a level of dignity to this new profession that equaled that of other professions. So in 1900, he and a group of other foresters met at the Department of Agriculture and uh, that gathering uh, was in, ended up being the formation of SAF. So, Today, SAF is a 10,000 member community that uh, has held true it's a, to its original objective to bring forestry and natural resource professionals together and keep them informed about the latest advances in forest science, ma science and management. So our local chapter is called the Mary's Peak chapter and um, all of our foresters here at Starker Forest are members. And prior to COVID, we would have um, monthly meetings often uh, in the basement of Tommy's Bar and Grill at seven o'clock in the morning, uh, where we would have breakfast and talk about some current topic in forestry. So as I know you are all aware, uh, Native Americans were the first forest managers. Um, many experts now contend that um, prehistoric people deliberately set fires to accomplish a variety of tasks. Uh, millions of acres in the U.S. had been cleared by 1500. Uh, Native Americans set forest fires for various reasons to improve visibility, facilitate travel, and control the habitat of the forest by removing unwanted plants. Uh, the most common use of fire was for food production. Uh, for example, blackberries and strawberries were more desirable than other plants, and they could get those through their burning practices. So we know there's a long history of fire in uh, the Pacific Northwest, and uh, these photos show the great uh, Nesteca burn, and, which was in 1845, and the Yaquina burn, which was in 19, uh, 1850, excuse me. Um, I thought the quote was kind of interesting. A trip through the Coast Range Mountains reveals to the eye of the traveler a vast expanse of dead timber whose charred Tall charred trunks are the, sep I have a hard time with that word, sep pearl. statues of a once green and luxuriant forest. The fire that devastated so much valuable timber on both sides of the Willamette River occurred in 1845. So it's interesting that we think of, the, I think of these burns that have the names of these coastal rivers, but then it's referring to the burn happening on both sides of the Willamette River. So. I suppose that means that the uh, west side of the Cascades probably burned too. The summer of that year was exceptionally dry and the trees and underbrush burned like tinder. So that of course made me think about the fires of 2020 last year and the devastation that they caused in the uh, Cascades and on the coast. 
Um, so touching on traditional ecological knowledge, I was thrilled to receive an email from the Lucky Meat Watershed Council last week about the two-part video series that's just released. So if you haven't seen that, go watch it. Um, I am uh, not uh, an expert in these topics, but there's two videos. One is on core concepts and the second one is on practical applications. Both of them are less than 35 minutes total and it's very educational and informative. I'd say the main way that we um, use traditional ecological knowledge in forestry is through fire. Um, local and ind indigenous communities manage forests and landscapes in many ways that sustain their livelihoods and cultured. Um, and we always want to make sure that what we're doing um, is, you know, taking care of the land and keeping it, in our case, you know, able to grow trees like in perpetuity so that, you know, we're not doing any damage. Uh, something else I was thinking about, about traditional ecological knowledge was in the top picture here. This is our um, retired chief forester, Gary Blanchard, and he's celebrating 60 years working for Starker Forest this year. 60, six zero. So um, he's a wealth of knowledge and information about um, the history of not only Starker Forest, but about the land that we manage. And so I'm so thankful that he um, still comes to the office most, most days. He lives next door to our office here. And um, when I'm out in the woods and I see something that I'm curious about and I'm wondering about the history of, of a certain thing, I can ask him and then he'll, he'll tell me about it. He remembers and knows and it's a really a great to have that resource. So I think about that similarly with uh, Native Americans who have tribal elders who um, tell stories of how how things were and it uh, now that I'm in the middle of my career and we have new foresters coming up you know that knowledge like gets passed down through the generations so we know forest management dates back at least 8,000 years um, it's evolved over time and we've learned from what's worked and what hasn't worked and one of the things about our cult culture here at Starker Forest is that um, we're not afraid to try new things and we know that from that we can learn um, whether our practices work or don't work. If and if it works, we can keep doing it. If it doesn't work, we can stop. So we've been burning our lands for decades uh, and it protects our lands by reducing the fuel loads and it also protects the lands of our neighbors as well. The Lucky Meat Watershed Council has a really rich history um, on our property near Airlie, there's um, the Williams Cemetery, which is shown in the picture on the right here. And there was a group of folks that approached us a few, a few years ago. Um, I think they're from the uh, Yamhill area and they go around and they um, fix up some of the pioneer cemeteries and they have the proper equipment and tools to do it the way that it's supposed to be done. And they're very careful. And they just volunteered to come onto our, our land now and um, clean up um, all the stones and they made it look really nice. And then it, now it makes it more manageable for us if we wanna go in and cut back the vegetation. Um, and of course, on the left-hand side here, we, we have the railroad history. It looks like there's a splash down there maybe in the back of the picture. But this is uh, the Lucky Mute, um, the, the Valley and Sluts Railroad. So Suzanne showed a picture of the watershed um, earlier. I have this uh, picture of the watershed that shows Starker Forest ownership. So the whole Lucky Mute watershed is about 202,000 acres and Starker Forest owns about 15,350. So it's about 7.6% of the watershed. So um, on the west side over here is, this is up along the um, Silets, uh, the Valsets main line. And then we have the upper um, Lucky Mute main line area here. This property uh, is near the Wildwood Bridge and Gage Road. And then down here in the, the bottom corner, we're just south of Hoskins um, along Alexander Road. And then moving across 
uh, Kings Valley Highway over to um, Maxfield Creek. And then this chunk right here in the middle with the different colors is uh, off of Ward Road. So the Starker ownership is you know, mixed around, around the watershed. So um, switching gears a little bit into the Oregon Forest Practices Act, uh, it started in uh, 1971. And I don't expect you to read all this. I promise you, I won't read it all. But uh, the point here is to show you that since the Oregon Forest Practices Act began, it's had many changes over time. And those changes have been uh, due to you know, new science and new information that informs us about how our practices affect the environment. So um, I think in all, there's over three dozen uh, changes that have been made since 1971 to the Oregon Forest Practices Act. So you might have heard about the private forest accord that's been in the news here uh, at the, the very end of October. Um, the history of that, uh, the private forest accord is uh, going to change the forest practice rules again. Um, there were competing ballot initiatives filed for the 2020 Oregon legislative session. There was three on the, the we'll say timber side and three on the uh, environmental side. Uh, and they were going to be um, challenging and uh, costly for both sides. Um, and the timber industry initiated talks to seek agreement on forest practice rule changes to increase environmental protections and provide more regulatory certainty for the industry. So one of the concerns about changes in forest practices is that if it uh, reduces the amount of land we can manage, it could potentially make an investment in forestry or in forest land uh, not worth it to the landowner. And we know for sure we want to keep our forests as forest in Oregon, and we have really strong land use laws to ensure that. Um, but it makes it challenging if um, if we can't grow trees, or or if we can't harvest the trees is probably more accurate to say. So Governor Brown uh, brokered a memorandum of understanding in February of 2020. Uh, that led to the passage of Senate Bill 1602, which passed in June of 2020. Uh, that required stricter notification requirements for helicopter spray operations, enhanced no spray buffers around schools and streams. Uh, these rules were first in the nation. So there's no other state in the US that has these types of notification requirements. Um, Ammon steelhead and bull trout rules into Southern Oregon. So the SSBT rules were changed for Northwest Oregon several years ago. It didn't include Southern Oregon um, and these rules uh, added Southern Oregon. The private forest accord had 13 organizations on each side that agreed to work together on this uh, originally the MOU, it's now become the private forest record. Starker Forest is one of the signatories to that um, process. And uh, we've been working hard over the last year to, um, to be actively you know, involved and engaged. The, uh, Accord and the agreements couldn't happen, of course, without other partners. And so those partners included the governor's office, environmental consultants, the Forest Service, the US Geological Survey, the US uh, EPA, uh, Fish and Wildlife Services, NOAA, Oregon Department of Forestry, and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. So at the end of October, Governor Brown announced that the ne negotiations um, had resulted in a historic proposal for new protections for sensitive species on over 10 million acres of forest land in Oregon. The representative for the Coalition of Forest Owners, David Bechtold, said that we're extremely proud to have started a process for more constructive engagement on forest policy issues. This is a new era that will produce the best outcomes for Oregon private forests and the communities that depend on them to provide clean water, recreation, renewable wood products, and year-round family wage jobs.
So the agreed framework agreed to increase buffers for streams. Uh, there will be steep slopes protections to minimize erosion and protect habitat, improvements to uh, forest roads, a path to make adjustments and adaptation to forest practices in the future. And then uh, the state of Oregon will bring forward a proposal for consideration by NOAA and US Fish and Wildlife Service for a habitat conservation plan for private forest land in Oregon. And the agreement would provide uh, regulatory certainty for the industry while protecting endangered and threatened species. So it's important to have that background because I want everybody to understand that um, the, the Forest Practice Act is always changing. And so we're kind of um, at the precipice of, of a really big change that's gonna be coming in the next uh, year or two. So the uh, legislation will have to be uh, written and approved by our legislature. And then the Department of Forestry will go into a rulemaking process. And those things don't happen quickly. So, um, you know, it's expected to last a year at least, if not two. Um, so switching gears a little bit about, um, I wanted to share what research is being published today about working forest land. So you might be wondering, like what do private landowners um, care about for research? Like, what do we wanna know? How do, how are, what are ways that we could change our management depending upon that, the uh, results of, of research questions? So, uh, I just gathered some screenshots of some published research that's been going on lately. So I'll go through those. Um, fish response to successive clear cuts in a second growth forest from the central coast range of Oregon. Long-term response of nutrient load from commercial forest management operations in a mountainous watershed. Reconciling biodiversity with timber production and revenue via an intensive forest management experiment. Behavior patterns of denning Pacific martins, effects of varying retention tree patterns on ground beetle taxonomic and functional diversity. That actually, that study actually happened uh, partly on Starker forest lands. Uh, North American porcupine distribution in the Pacific Northwest and evaluation of a non-invasive monitoring technique. I have to confess, I see porcupines occasionally in the woods, but I don't think about them very much. And so, you know, it's interesting to know that there's um, research going on about them. Uh, marbled mirrorlet nest site selection at three fine spatial scales, predicted distribution of a rare and understudied forest carnivore, the Humboldt Martin. These are under this, the, the Humboldt Martins under consideration under the Endangered Species Act uh, to be listed as endangered. So they have become very popular. Uh, in experimental evaluation of herbicide use on biodiversity, ecosystem services, and timber production trade-offs in forest plantations, and 50 years of runoff response to conversion of old growth forest to planted forest on the H.J. Andrews Forest, Oregon, USA. Coincidentally, the H.J. Andrews forest uh, was almost entirely impacted by the 2020 burns um, and, and quite a bit of it burned. So at Starker Forest, we it's very convenient to be in a place where we're next to a major land grant university like Oregon State and we can provide the land. Most, the most common way we're involved in this research is not that we have researchers on our, on our staff here, it's that we can provide the land uh, to uh, run these experiments and do the research. So the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement uh, is, represents um, their researchers who do research for uh, forest landowners. Uh, and we host a lot of tours and participate in many different co-ops. There's like a Swiss needle cast co-op, a vegetation management co-op, um, reforestation co-op, um, and we stay current um, on emerging research by, you know, always continuing our education. So our wildlife biologists, um, well, our, we, there's a new publication out, uh, which is shown in the top picture here called Wildlife in Managed Forests, and in it, it speaks to these um, structures called biodens. So they're intentionally created to create habitat and they can be created in a, in a clear cut next to the edge of the timber and 
uh, wildlife can use it for denning or escaping predators and, and co for cover. Um, and so there's the bottom picture shows the signage that we had to put around this bioden that we left on the landscape. So normally we would burn the slash, um, but this has given us an opportunity to leave some of the pile, to create a pile with the larger wood like it's shown here um, for specifically wildlife habitat. So that does take away a few uh, places where we, we would plant trees, uh, but we think it's important to do this. But there's logistic concerns. So I realized that I needed a sign because somebody would probably try to come cover the pile like they cover the other piles with uh, polyethylene so that we can keep them dry to wait until the winter, the, the fall rain so we can burn them. I didn't want anybody cutting firewood out of this biogen um, and I didn't want anybody lighting it on fire. So we had to make a sign, we translated it into Spanish. So put it on three sides of the, of the structure. So hopefully it wouldn't be damaged and it wasn't. So this has been there for over a year now. So I finally actually just removed the signs so we can use them for another site. Um, healthy streams are really important to uh, our, our state, to, to all of us, obviously. Um, and one of the projects we worked with the Lucky Meat Watershed Council was the South Fork PD project. And uh, I'm not gonna talk about the whole project. It's a gigantic pro project in my view, um, but one of the things we could do on our property at, at, in that uh, stream was uh, replacing an uh, old culvert with a new bridge. So you can see in the pictures what the old culvert looked like. And it was a pretty big culvert, but it did get uh, over top, the road got over top during some of the highest flows. And we replaced it with a uh, 60 foot bridge. And so you can see uh, this picture was taken last winter. Um, the stream is quite wide and has a lot more complexity now uh, as compared to the previous outlet area where that culvert was. This is a picture of the upstream uh, area on Stroker properties where you can see that there's logs that were placed in the stream and there's a giant pile of junk here that, that got caught up. So this, we had a ice storm and a lot of the riparian area actually kind of fell apart and fell into the creek, which is fine. It's mostly hardwood, so it's not gonna last as long as the conifers, but it did get really, um, a lot of the smaller pieces got caught up here right in the middle of this picture. So there's a lovely pool here. This is my dog, Molly, here. Um, and the one reason why, I mean, I'm not, wouldn't normally be excited to say, oh, the riparian area completely fell apart, but the Lucky Meat Watershed Council planted a, a many conifers in this riparian area. And I think they're gonna have a better chance of survival because now they have more sunlight to grow in because the hardwood trees uh, blew over. So the project also included the installation of 319 logs and 22 structures along 2.1 miles of stream. So uh, like I said, that's not all on Starker, but there's many partners involved. Uh, we've been working with the Lucky Mute Council for a long time. This picture right here, this, uh, your fearless leader, um, Kristen Larson is in the red jacket right here. And we were defishing a portion of stream several years ago. I don't remember what year it was, maybe 2012 or 13. Um, and we placed logs in, in this part of the stream. And um, the picture on the right shows, you know, what it looks like when the logs are placed in the stream. And uh, kind of a funny story, this, the picture with the people, that's Wolf Creek up the Lucky Mute uh, main line. And, uh, there's a really nice swimming hole where the Wolf Creek meets um, the main stem. And it's only about, I don't know, 500 feet from where this picture was taken. And so my family and I were out there last summer going for a swim on a, on a hot weekend. And I said to my kids, you know, hey, I want to show you this log project I did. And they've heard me talk about this for years, so they probably just roll their eyes, but they came. And uh, the moment we stepped into Wolf Creek out of the main stem, everybody said, oh my gosh, this water's freezing. And so it was a really good, um, I don't know, it just made it so obvious that these smaller uh, tributaries that are flowing into the bigger main stem stems 
are providing like really cold water. And it was really noticeable, even, you know, on a 95 degree day in August, uh, the, the water in this side tributary uh, was much colder than the main stem. So I, I wouldn't say that I attribute it to a, the log placement project, but I'm, I know it's happening. Uh, the, the picture on the right here with the crane shows the, the bridge project at Petey Creek. And so these are big projects. These, this bridge cost, uh, you know, in the neighborhood of $150,000. And we split the cost with Hancock Forest Management. Uh, you've got big trucks that are hauling these uh, beams and uh, backing up long distances on forest roads often. You've got cranes, uh, you've got the bridge construction company. I, I think this day where we were installing this uh, bridge, you know, we've, oh, I, I just remembered, we had four family owned companies working on the project. And I added up all of the times that they've been in business. So Forsland Crane is out of Albany. They've been in business since the 1940s. Mike Adams Construction out of Staten is our bridge contractor. They've been in business since the 1940s. Um, the trucking service out of Seattle, because they are specialized in hauling these long beams, um, has been in business since the 40s. Starker Forest has been in business since the 1930s. So I mean, we had like 150 years of small family business, like working on this project this one day. So, and then the picture on the right, or the left, excuse me, um, is what it looks like on the inside of a stream bed simulation culvert. So if we're not doing a bridge and we're uh, crossing a fish stream, we'll put a stream bed simulation culvert in. And the idea is that it purposely fills up with these gravels and uh, looks like a stream, a little darker, obviously, but uh, the, a fish wouldn't know or shouldn't, shouldn't have any difficulty swimming through that culvert. So this was a picture today. I am in a great mood tonight because I got to walk in a stream today and watch salmon spawning. So I was, uh, this is um, Skunk Creek, a tributary to Fall Creek out of the LC watershed. And uh, we were, I was with the ODF and W fish biologist and we we're, we're looking to do a log placement project in this stream. And she was walking behind me and all of a sudden she just exclaimed, salmon! And the salmon, it just like, it was a coho and it just took off downstream and uh, it was really fun to watch. So you can see the, um, see my cursor here. This is, there's a, a Chinook salmon right here. And you can see the white back there. So, so the Chinook salmon are finishing their run and the coho are, are getting going. So both of those uh, fish were in this stream today, uh, which was really enjoyable. So we've been involved in some pollinator research. So I, I know you've probably all heard about uh, the importance of pollinators uh, lately. And uh, Dr. Sarah Galbraith of OSU um, managed this study that we did on Starker Forest lands. And she did, she did it on other landowners as well. But her study was how does pollinator health change with stand age and management intensity in managed conifer forests? She was comparing bee communities, bee habitat, and pollination services. Used uh, trapping, netting, pollinator exclusion, and managed osmia nests. That's, um, what are those? Mason bees. Um, and that would be the uh, visitor, uh, visitor bee. Uh, hoping to better understand the extent in which managed forests per, uh, provide habitat for visitors, uh, visiting pollinators and the impact that management decisions have on pollinators and pollination. So, you know, we're, we know our, our young forests, our, our clear cuts, uh, you know, from age three up until stand closure, which can be anywhere from age like 15 to 18, maybe, um, you know, pollinators, it's a really important place for pollinators. So we're interested in research about this. Um, another topic of interest, uh, we get asked this more and more by the public these days is what trees are you, are you planting for trees that'll, you know, grow better here in the future, thinking about climate change. So we're part of a co-op that's trying to identify vigorous and or hardy genotypes of redwood that can better withstand cooler northern climates. 
So the redwoods, the redwoods of Northern California are not as hardy as they need to be uh, to live here now. So if we're gonna plant them now, they need to survive now, irregardless of what is going to be going on with the temperatures in 75 years. So we planted some redwoods this year in some research plots. Fun fact about redwoods, we don't call them seedlings because they're not propagated from seeds, but from tissue cultures. Um, there is science involved in our conventional timber harvest as well. So equipment is constantly being, um, you know, adapted to the landscape it's working on. You know, we can do more now than we could do with machinery, um, you know, decades ago. Machinery is uh, getting bigger in, in general. Um, this is a picture of a, a yarder uh, with the cables on it where the cables are attached to the logs and then the yarder uh, can pull the logs up the hill to this location, which is called the landing. And then the uh, Caterpillar machine there is a processor. So it has uh, on the end of the boom, there is a processor head and it can uh, grab the tree and cut it into the appropriate lengths to be loaded on a log truck. Tethered logging is a relatively new logging system that is being used all over the world um, in eucalyptus forests, Scandinavian forests, European forests, and, um, and here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, um, tethered logging is, if you look, if you see on this picture, whoops, I need to go that fast. The, um, cable here on the back of this machine, that's what it, that's what's referred to as the tethering. So the machine is tethered or anchored to either another machine or a stump or series of stumps on a landing and it allows the machine to go um, down a steeper slope. So naturally you would ask the question, what is the soil disturbance like with this different you know, harvest method? So um, this study was soil disturbance and stream adjacent disturbance from tethered logging in Oregon and Washington. Uh, this shows a picture of where the um, study was done. So you can see down into Coos County, Douglas County, up the, looks like they were doing this on the um, west side of the Cascades. And then we have a, a Polk County spot there and uh, up north into Washington, Clatsop County and Columbia County. So it's important that when we do research that it's done in a place that's similar to where we work if we wanna use the results of that research in the places where we work. Uh, this picture shows the um, transects that they took to um, measure the soil disturbance and the green transects looks like the disturbance class is number one. So that's the least amount of disturbance. And then where you can see the red, that would be the most, uh, most disturbance uh, in, the, in the research data collection. So they found that tethered logging in the Pacific Northwest has shown promise of improving safety for woods workers through reduce, reduced exposure hours and increasing economic efficiency of steep slope harvest operations. And uh, through this study, we evaluated soil disturbance and stream adjacent disturbance across a broad geographic scope to understand the environmental impacts and inform best management practices for tethered operations. Um, evaluating the environmental performance of the technology such as tethered logging is critical for the sustainable production of wood and wood products. And the study indicated that while soil disturbance associated with tethered machines harvesting trees on steep slopes is greater than that caused by conventional steep slope harvest practices, disturbance levels are similar to those seen with untethered heavy machinery and meet or exceed regional thresholds for in-unit and stream adjacent soil disturbance. So, you know, research like this is important to make sure that we know that we're not um, increasing disturbance on, on the soil as we're harvesting our trees. Because we do have another method to do this kind of harvest, the traditional cable logging method. So another one I wanted to talk about is harvesting in sediment. Uh, 
quantifying the effects of forest harvesting on sources of suspended sediment to an Oregon Coast Range headwater stream. So I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago and we were talking about water quality in municipal water source streams and the person told me that if, uh, if we had a clear cut, it would definitely impact their soil water quality. And so I uh, would not say that that is definitely always going to happen. I think it could, could happen but it also could not happen depending upon how the harvest is done and uh, you know, what precautions are, are taken to minimize any sediment entering the waterway. So this um, research happened on Starker Forest. Uh, this picture on the right, the dashed area in kind of a tan color down here is a timber harvest. And uh, this is just out of Philomath. And so we have timber harvest adjacent to the stream. It's a fish bearing stream, so there was a buffer on the stream. And then we have a control watershed on the uh, left picture here. So we know that elevated fine sediment transport is not good for aquatic ecosystem health, downstream infrastructure and community water supply. The study quantified the proportional contributions of suspended sediment from three potential sources, hill slopes, roads, and stream banks. So the question the researchers had, and the main researcher was Kevin Bladen at OSU, uh, he wanted to know, um, it, when you have sediment in the stream, and you can look in any stream, certainly during like weather events, and you see the water changes color, and that means there's sediment there, where is that sediment coming from? Is it coming from the hill slope, the roads, or the stream banks themselves? So they have a um, DNA source sediment uh, fingerprint technique now where they could figure out where exactly this uh, sediment was coming from. And the study found out that the stream bank sediment uh, made up 90% of the sediment in the stream. And the hill slope sediment was 7%. Of course, there, you see the, the errors there. And then um, the road sediment was only 3.6%. So this is hugely informative to us as land managers. It is saying that, that in this case, um, that the most of the sediment in the stream was coming from the stream itself. Uh, in the reference catch basin or the reference watershed, there was no contributions from roads um, despite a similar road network as the harvested, harvested catchment. So we had uh, you know, roads in both areas. Uh, despite minimal effects from harvesting, our study was able to document road contributions coinciding with a period of road maintenance and increased logging traffic. Okay, so that tells us that if we have um, road maintenance and increased logging traffic during the winter time, that that is going to have an increased likelihood of contributing sediment to the stream. We know that, this confirms that. Um, in both the harvested and reference catchment, stream banks were the primary contributor, as I just said, uh, but the greatest sediment concentration were, uh, were observed in the reference catchment. Sediment source fingerprinting techniques indicated that best management practices were relatively effective at minimizing sediment delivery, delivery from roads and hill slopes following forest harvesting of a catchment in the Oregon Coast Range. So I thought this was great news. Uh, of course, I was a little bit involved with the project, so I, it's easy to get excited about things that you're involved with. The challenge would be how do you um, spread that out to other watersheds? You know, we know that this was the case in this particular watershed with these soils, but would it be the same in other, uh, other ones as well? Um, so I, Suzanne or Kendra asked me to talk a little bit about herbicides. Um, and so I've got a few slides here. Uh, forest landowners are responsible for only 4% of all pesticides um, by weight used in Oregon every year. Uh, herbicides in forestry are used to meet reforestation goals and to keep vegetation down that competes with seedlings for soil moisture. Uh, we're members of the Vegetation Management Research Co-op at OSU, so we're involved in applied re reforestation research of young forests after planting. 
So why do we spray? We spray to promote the survival and growth of our young seedlings. So TJ Starker's quote was, we're just trying to give the seedlings a fighting chance. So you can see from the pictures on this page, you, on the left, we have a tree, the seedlings that are not competing with other vegetation. So there's been treatment there or herbicides have been applied. And on the right hand side, you can see there's lots of competing vegetation and uh, herbicides have not been applied. Um, so we also use it to reduce the uh, amount of noxious weeds on the site. We use it to treat invasive species such as scotch broom, false broom, and knotweed. Um, and depending upon the treatment, it could be served for survival or to promote better growth and form in the seedling. Uh, here is a picture of a clear cut that has had an herbicide application. And one of the things that is important to notice about this picture is that you see the green strips in the stream areas. So those would be non-fish bearing streams that under current rule have no regulation for um, buffers, uh, timbered buffers, um, but there is water there. And so the, that is, if for whatever herbicide was used, the label would say that uh, it's not, cannot be applied on water. So those areas would be buffered. And you can see that, that that's very effective because if there was drift, um, the green areas would not be green. They would be brown like the rest of the hill slope. Um, and it, uh, one example of, of a herbicide that um, the research of using it has informed us about is, the, is atrazine. So atrazine was formerly uh, commonly used in forest management and it's uh, not not used anymore. So it was uh, discovered that it could move in water and that is not something we wanna use. So forest companies stopped using it. And now in the last couple of years, the forestry label has been removed. So we, do, the, we don't have the ability to use it in forest, forestry anymore. We don't wanna use it anymore anyway. So we stopped using it first and then they changed the regulations. So we protect the environment uh, when we use herbicides, we follow the label. The label is the law. Label, if you're using herbicides around your house, there's a label on that as well. Um, we follow the Oregon Forest Practices Act. We apply only when the weather permits. We consult with a harvest team uh, about neighbors, water supplies, property lines, and protected resources and we stay current on research to inform our management decisions. Um, I wanted to touch, um, getting close to the end, I promise, I know we wanna leave time for questions. Um, I wanted to, one topic about research versus policy. Um, the private forest accord addresses beavers. I believe the agreement says that commercial trapping will be prohibited on private forest lands in Oregon um, with the private forest accord. Um, but one part of it says participate with ODF and W to develop a voluntary beaver relocation program. So that caught my interest because I've listened to several presentations from uh, Vanessa Petro, who is a beaver researcher at Oregon State. And she did a research project on beaver relocation. This was in 2011. This was published in 2015. So it says, evaluating landowner-based beaver relocation as a tool to restore salmon habitat, um, relocating beavers from unwanted sites has been posited as a method to enhance in-stream habitat for salmon. Dams are the key components by which beavers have recognized as ecosystem engineers and keystone species. Animal relocation generally supports one of three goals, solving a human wildlife conflict, restocking game populations or conservation. And no studies had uh, evaluated this method prior to this study. So from September to December, 2011, they trapped and relocated 38 nuisance beavers using guidelines available to Oregon landowners. And in the result was of the 30 radio tagged beavers, eight died within 30 days, four died within 90 days, um, mountain lions were identified as the uh, cause for six of the beavers suspected in the seventh, and then three beavers died from disease or illness. 
Their results suggested that not all beavers build dams in all, in all circumstances. And their results corresponded with previous observations that beaver dams are pri primarily ephemeral or you know, they come and go in the Oregon coast range. Uh, beaver relocation, uh, relocation of nuisance beavers may not offer an effective solution to lethal control measures as originally perceived by the general public. And furthermore, releasing beavers to an unfamiliar site combined with the stress of trapping, handling, and moving may influence their susceptibility to predators. So um, go back to this for a sec. I just thought I find this to be interesting because if the study shows that um, beaver relocation is not especially effective, um, it did make its way into this agreement with the private forest accord. And so um, how do Starker Forest feel about beavers? I'm, I like beavers. Um, I, they do a great job of, um, you know, building dams and doing what beavers do. Uh, we used to trap beavers quite a bit uh, when I first started working as a forester. That was when we had not upgraded all of our culverts for fish passage. And now that we've done that and many of our stream crossings across roads are much wider, we're not having the conflicts that we used to have. So if beavers are not causing us conflicts with our roads or eating our trees, we're fine with them being on the landscape. I would say though that this would this this new policy you know will put uh, commercial beaver trappers out of out of work though and so that uh, that's a little bothersome. Uh, wanted to talk briefly about fall fall planting. I'm almost finished. I have five more slides. Um, we began looking at fall planting in the late 1990s. Um, the plant water balance is the key to element to achieve success. So the idea with fall planting is that uh, the soil uh, temperatures are still elevated. And uh, if we plant some seedlings, they can do some root growth, uh, not top growth, because they will be shut down at the nursery uh, by using blackout shades uh, so that they're not growing anymore on the top, but their roots will grow. And so the idea is that in the, then in the next spring, when the tree starts growing, it will have a stronger root system and it can produce more top growth. Yeah, we think of things like this as happening, like maybe that means eventually over time we, we can use less um, you know, herbicides. You know, we only use what we need, um, but we use it as a tool. So we have these tools in our toolbox to achieve our goals and um, that, can, that can change over time depending upon new research in one department or the other. So this picture shows a fall planted seedling. Um, you can see that amazing root growth of that seedling. Um, and then the picture on the right is just showing some uh, nutrition research. This is not related to fall planting, but we do a lot of uh, nutritional research on trees. The problem with being a forest landowner with nutritional research and nutrition is that you know, adding nutrition to millions, millions and millions of trees is probably not going to be very cost effective. But you know, we're always trying to think outside the box and think about ways we can do what we do better. This was a study we were doing to um, uh, look at the um, the root growth and measure the root growth and measure the top growth. This is just in our shop, <laughs> and so kind of funny when you walk in the shop and it's like, who's doing what now? You know, what, what are they thinking about now for research? And I wanted to touch lastly on um, risks in forest management. That was our main rich risk is natural disasters. Of course, fires is, is the biggest one, but we had that amazing uh, heat wave at the end of May in which uh, the trees were just like the, the growth on the trees was so like new and fragile in May. You know, a, a tree in um, July and August can handle the hot weather, but they're not used to this kind of weather in, in uh, the end of May. And so you can see the damage that was done by the, the, the hot temperatures, that heat dome that we had. It just um, scalded the needles and especially the new growth and particularly on the south and the west side of the trees. Just a couple more pictures of what that looked like. So do we think that the trees will survive this? Yes, the mature trees, I, I think so. Um, but it did kill a lot of seedlings that had just been planted um, and we'll have to replant those seedlings. This is the pictures from an ice storm in 2014. This impacted um, 
north the northern end of Benton County and the southern end of Polk County. So every bit of uh, kind of white that you see on the right hand picture is a top of a tree that's been broken off. And so we ended up having to clear cut 35 year old stands, which is well below our average um, because 80 to 90% of the trees had broken tops and we felt like they weren't gonna recover from that. So we're always keeping our eye on upcoming opportunities for, you know, as professional foresters. So this lists uh, just some of the names of the upcoming um, seminars and conferences that are coming up uh, related to forest management. So we have one on forest seedling root development, soil impacts uh, from harvest operations, new or, or OSHA rules. Um, there's something in the or OSHA rules about, I hope nobody works for or OSHA, <laughs> uh, about like the temperature of water you're supposed to drink if you're working out in the woods on a hot day. And it, it makes us as sort of seasoned foresters kind of scratch our heads. It's like, wait, water's supposed to be wet temperature? I usually just care if it's wet. But um, anyway, we do need to follow these rules, whether we like them or not. And so it is important to know what they are. Um, and then certainly there's a lot going on about post-fire um, salvage logging and effective mitigations for soil erosion and sediment delivery. Uh, so looking forward, we're working with you know, new technology like drones. Uh, we are not using drones to plant any trees yet. Those are being done by hand. So even though we're always looking at new technology, uh, keep in mind that um, what we know how to do and know how to do well is to plant trees we're going to keep doing that. So that's all I have. Thank you. I know I went for a long time. I appreciate your interest and I'm happy to answer questions. These are our office dogs. So um, we have 10 off forestry dogs and we managed to get eight of them in the conference room for a picture a couple weeks ago. One of them wouldn't come in because they're normally not allowed in this room. And the one, one of them was like, nope, not going to do it. I'm not allowed in that room. <laughs> <laughs> this is an amazing picture, Jennifer. I uh, can't believe you, uh, you're able to take all those, the picture of all the dogs in the conference room. But thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to getting to our Q&A. Um, oh, oh, great. Now we can see everybody, uh, or uh, the, the panelists anyway. And uh, so please go ahead and put your Q, uh, your question in the Q&A box and Kendra will, uh, can, will go ahead and read what we've already got. Yeah, um, I'll start with one. Um, if he, they ask, do you know the location of the railway over the Lucky Mint River in that picture you showed us, the black and white one? I don't, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to imagine where it like might be. I know somebody who might know though, but that's not really useful right now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then another question was about fall planting. When you say fall planting, um, around what month, which month are you talking about? Oh yeah. Sorry. I didn't mention that. So it has to be once the rains have come. So we have tried it in September. We occasionally get some moisture in September, but I'd say solidly we started in October. Um, I was looking, it, it probably correlates to when fire season ends. Um, and that's usually after we get some several weather systems that come through the coast range. So that could be mid to late October and then into November and December. And then we switch into kind of our winter planting mode then. Okay, cool. Well, they ask a follow-up question about that too, because they were just wondering is how do you have your, they say often seedling stock isn't ready until winter, correct? Or is that's that right. not the way it is for you? Yeah, no, that's right. So um, we have our, uh, we get our seed from uh, seed orchards. We, ha we uh, have a participate in a seed orchard cooperative and um, we send our seeds to nurseries in, uh, at Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And they have some really great technology for what, we, it's called blackout, where they shut the trees down um, by covering, you know, taking away the light. And so the top green part of the tree shuts down its growth. Um, and like I said, the, the roots can keep growing. So we're, um, we receive our seedlings and we, we are growing them. They are growing them for Starker Forest. And uh, 
we were supposed to get a delivery tomorrow, but uh, the flooding that's happened in Washington has uh, delayed that until Thursday. So um, these tre the trees will come come down in trucks. And fortunately, um, it was okay to get um, seedlings across the border during COVID, even though we couldn't go to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'm glad the trees are able to come down. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, uh, the next question just says, great presentation. Thanks. And then are there any plans to start cleaning logging equipment prior to moving it to the next job site to prevent the spread of seeds from invasive species? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think there's a very um, minimal chance of getting our loggers to do that voluntarily unless it was required. Um, it would be a lot of work and uh, I know it is required on by some landowners. I, I would suspect by agency landowners like the Forest Service in certain places. Um, I noticed the false brome in McDonald Forest and uh, I think one of the ways that that's traveled as well as by, you know, wildlife like deer and elk or even hikers or bikers. And um, so, no, we don't have any plans to do that now would be the answer to the answer to the question, but um, new things are always coming up. Okay. Um, and then someone, this might be just for you, Suzanne, will these slides recordings be made available to us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, after tonight, uh, probably not tonight, literally, but tomorrow morning, I'll be going through and um, adding this presentation to our website and also adding it to YouTube. Um, so you'll be able to watch and share. And you'll also be getting an email from me uh, with the direct link once it's available. Um, so look for that email coming sometime tomorrow uh, or the next day at the latest. Okay, thank you. All right, so here's another one. What are the rules for protection on small non-fish bearing streams that are so important for cool water and reducing sedimentation? The current rules are um, that uh, we cannot spray them. There, so if there's a small non-fish bearing stream that's running water, we cannot spray over that. So that'll be buffered uh, for an herbicide application. For harvesting operations, there is no buffer, uh, wooded, bu um, timbered buffer right now, um, but there is a vegetation buffer. Uh, and so, you know, as responsible landowners, we don't go back and forth through non-fish streams and muck them up. You know, that's not a good um, strategy. Um, but the new forest rules under the uh, private forest accord will be, it's on this desk somewhere, but I don't think I'm gonna find it. I wanna say 70 feet for uh, non-fish non bearing streams. Well, I actually I misspoke. So there's going to be a, a distance from, um, from the fish bearing stream. So uh, it'll go up a certain distance from, from the fish bearing stream up the non-fish bearing stream. And that would be a, I think it's 70 feet on both sides. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I have one more here. Um, oh, actually a couple more. What would the best way to get involved with forestry, what would be the best way to be involved with the forestry harvest and management, especially while in college, but looking at a career in forestry, what would you suggest? Oh, good question. Uh, give me a call and, and I'll talk to you about it. Um, I picked forestry out of a hat. I grew up near Sacramento, uh, you know, amongst oak trees and no, no conifers. I came to Oregon State and uh, really just fell in love. And so there's community colleges and universities in Oregon that teach forestry. And now there's also um, high schools uh, that teach forestry as well. Um, there are career fairs, and if you're a, a forestry student at a university like Oregon State, they have a field school that they require their students to attend, and that's how they can get on the ground experience. 
And then also we're accepting applications right now for forestry students uh, to apply for summer internships. And so um, our uh, crew, summer crew supervisor attended a um, job fair at Oregon State uh, last week and we're accepting um, applications. And so all of us uh, that have worked in forestry, almost all unanimously had forestry jobs when we were in college. And so I started with a job at the Forest Service. I got to mark timber on the Tahoe National Forest and then fight fire. And I worked for International Paper Company out of Vanita. And then I worked for Starker Forest. And it just gave me you know, three totally different experiences of big company, small company, and a federal agency. And um, it's a it's a great career choice. I mean, I, I think most people who are working in forestry are generally pretty happy with their careers. So I great. briefly saw the chat there. I didn't want to look at the chat when I was giving my presentation because um, then it distracts me. But uh, Richard says you used to work with Gary in the early 60s, mm -hmm. pulling the chain. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to write your name down so I don't forget that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see Gary tomorrow morning. He usually gets here before me still. <laughs> That's so nice. All right. I'm gonna, I have two more questions here, and then we'll see if you, there's still time. If you have one, you can put one in here. Um, what are Starker's plans for the future planting of southwest facing slopes in regards to climate change? Hmm. So for now we're, you know, it's, I'd have to say it, it's still a status quo. Like there's not enough evidence that the temperatures are gonna be different. I mean, we, we know the season, like the, the summer is probably going to be longer, um, but the modeling right now still shows that, um, you know, the precipitation shouldn't, should be similar in 50 years. Um, and so there's, there's just not enough evidence that we should be doing anything different yet. But, you know, I didn't really talk about carbon and climate change and, but we do see forests as a, a natural climate solution. And so whether it's growing trees for the purposes of making wood products, um, growing trees to just grow trees, um, and um, getting into the carbon credit market. Um, you know, we think that forests are a, a really important um, solution. For sure. Okay, and the last one I have here, uh, does successive harvesting for decades and centuries reduce the productivity of the soil? Well, we certainly don't know for centuries yet um, because we're, I mean, we're just approaching our first century generally of, of timber harvest. So we're planting uh, stands that have been harvested um, twice. So the stands right now that are being harvested in 2020 uh, were previously reforested in the 1950s, 60s. Um, and then the previous harvest to that would be around the turn of the, of the previous century. So around 1900. So you know, so far there's no indication that we're having any difficulty growing our trees, you know, from a nutrition standpoint. You know, we are dealing with Swiss needle cast in the coast range, which is a fungal disease. Um, but that's, uh, so far we don't have any evidence that, that the nutrition of the soil is being depleted. That said, I could be wrong. I'm not a nutritionist. <laughs> and it could happen in places. So I think, you know, I'm saying this in a very general term over, you know, a large land area, but you could certainly have places where I suppose that could happen. Many okay. people know a lot more about that than me. All right. That, thank you. I, that's all the questions I have right now, unless anyone has something oh. else they want to put in there. Oh, Suzanne would like to ask a question. I have to know, if you don't call little baby redwood seedlings, what do you call them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to bother me now. No. Uh -oh. I'll have to look it we up. Can, we can make something up. Yeah. <laughs> Babies. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Redwoodlings, yeah. Redwoodlings, yeah. <laughs> Sprouts, I guess. That works. Well, <laughs> once again, I really appreciate you coming uh, tonight to our Zoom uh, webinar for the Simpson Science, Jennifer. Your presentation was awesome. And uh, and uh, yes, it was long, but it, every bit of it was engaging and really interesting. And I learned a lot. Good. 
about Thank Starker you. and the way that you manage your forest. So, and about the current um, policy changes coming up. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, and thank you welcome. so much to you, Kendra, as well, for managing our Q&A and also to all of our participants tonight. Um, thank you so much for, for all your, uh, your questions and your, your listening ears. And I hope you will join us uh, for another Steps and Signs. As I said, we, we are, we, this is the first one. We have another one coming up in on December 1st. It's uh, Black Settlement History in Oregon. So we're inviting Troy Tate from the Oregon Black Pioneers uh, to come and talk about the early Black Pioneers in this part of Oregon. And it should be really interesting, engaging, and he is a renowned speaker. So um, check out our website for more information on that and for future slips and science coming in January or February about splash damming in the Lucky Mute. So hope you'll join us again. Uh, thanks again. Uh, may you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye-bye.